Hello everyone uh, and welcome to yet another episode of Next Pattern EQ Discussions. Right, so uh, I'm Dr. Deepthi Sethi and I would be discussing an obstetrics question today. And uh, you know, when we say it is a next pattern question, we want to show you how clinically integrated MCQs look like and how to approach these MCQs. Right, so we have been doing this integrated approach uh, MCQ discussion series for quite some time and I hope this one again you will find useful. So let's look at this question. So this is a 29 year old G2P1. She presents to us at 28 weeks. Now she had a normal hemoglobin level four weeks ago uh, which was her first prenatal visit and now for past one week she's complaining of fatigue and when her hemoglobin was checked it turned out to be seven gram percent. She noted dark color urine after taking an antibiotic for a urinary tract infection. Which of the following is the most likely diagnosis? Right? So if you look at this question and we begin the question, it looks like an obstetric MCQ because it says she is a pregnant woman at 28 weeks who is presenting to us with certain symptoms. When you read the question further, you realize that uh, the question is to do with anemias, right? So probably going down to basics of uh, anemias. And then when you go even further, you realize that there is one more, uh, you know, clinical catch in the MCQ that her symptoms are related to an episode. So those are the key things here. So she is an obstetric patient who's 28 weeks pregnant, who's been doing fine so far, but now she complains of symptoms of fatigue with low hemoglobin levels and the third key in the mcq is all this has happened following an antibiotic which she used for a, a urinary tract infection now let's see how do we approach this mcq before i really give you the options to the question right now if you look at this question um history of fatigue uh, a sudden drop in hemoglobin levels to significant low values right and uh, dark colored urine, what does it tell you? Probably all this is linked towards or is, uh, you know, uh, letting us to think towards hemolysis, right? So following something and we have all the features of hemolysis like, you know, pallor. I'm sure this woman on clinical examination is going to be pale. She has significant reduction in hemoglobin levels there is dark urine which is because of bilirubinuria right and uh, you know on clinic so find her jaundiced right and as i said an abrupt fall in hemoglobin so these are all pointers which tell us that we are dealing towards hemolytic anemias right now if we look at the causes of hemolytic anemias and i'm just talking about the gross causes right we have inherited hemolytic anemias like there could be thalassemias it could be sickle cell disease it could be hereditary spherocytosis those are the common ones it could be acquired hemolytic anemias usually these are immune mediated they could be non-immune mediated as well a typical example being sla then there can be drug induced hemolytic anemias like g6pd then there could be other causes like DIC or transfusion related hemolytic anemias. So if you look at this, we have a, a obstetric patient in whom we are suspecting an episode of hemolytic anemia who was previously absolutely well, right? And as we go back to the MCQ, you can also see that the episode has typically happened after an antibiotic use, right? So which means which kind of hemolytic anemia are we talking about? Probably drug induced, right? So we've already reached this, that it is probably a drug induced episode of hemolytic anemia. Now let us look at the options. So the same question and now the options that we have for this patient are, is she having iron deficiency anemia? Is it thalassemia? Is it G6PD or is it sickle cell disease, right? So an obstetric question eventually went down to anemias and now you will see that it can be also linked to, uh, you know, biochemistry. So that's what we mean when we talk about next pattern or clinically integrated 
MCQs. Right? Now, let us look at option A. Why is this unlikely to be iron deficiency anemia? Because, uh, you know, otherwise we would say that after physiological anemia, iron deficiency anemia is the second most common cause of anemia in pregnant women. So how do we rule out IDA or iron deficiency anemia in this patient? Now, if you realize we've already given to you that this patient was absolutely well up till four weeks back. So even at 24 weeks, that's when she had her first antenatal visit and a basic workup was done. She had absolutely normal reports. Whereas if it is iron deficiency, Anemia, you know, it would not suddenly drop down to, from normal values to 7 gram percent, right? So iron deficiency anemia will build up and it can start early in pregnancy because, you know, um, uh, as we know that there is going to be a hemodilution which begins as early as 6 to 10 weeks, right? And there will be a gradual decline of the hemoglobin levels. And, uh, you know, yes, the peak decline would be seen at around 24 to 28 weeks. But here we don't see a gradual decline. Also, had it been iron deficiency anemia, right, she would have even prior to 28 weeks but we, we are saying that she was absolutely normal prior to this visit right so that's why we rule out iron deficiency anemia in her how do we rule out option b thalassemia or option d sickle cell disease right again thalassemia or sickle cell disease if they are thalassemia major traits or intermediate traits they would manifest even prior to pregnancy she would be a known case only traits you know will have mild anemias right usually the hemoglobins are above 10 gram percent right but still there would be some deficit in the hemoglobin levels there would be evidence of microcytosis yes on the peripheral smear in this patient we have again given it to you that her previous reports were all normal right and also you know hemoglobin electrophoresis is something that we do as a baseline investigation for women in their antenatal checkup right so that's how we rule out thalassemia okay then sickle cell disease how do we rule out sickle cell disease now if this sudden episode of fall of hemoglobin is because of sickle cell crisis the patient would be much more symptomatic right they're going to be bone pains it is a painful condition but in this patient there are no such uh, pains patient is complaining of she's only complaining of fatigue or weakness right so uh, because of absence of the characteristic features of sickle cell disease especially at the time of sickling crisis we rule out that this is unlikely to be a sickle cell disease so that that means we are left with g6pd yes and which also correlates with the history so g6pd deficiency uh, you know is an enzyme deficiency which leads to oxidative stress on the rbcs and as a result of which rbcs undergo hemolysis and you know this oxidative stress normally what happens is g6pd is going to produce nadph which protects the rbc from the oxidative stress now, once there is a deficiency of G6PD, this protective effect is gone. So, whenever there is going to be an oxidative stress, there is going to be hemolysis. Now, this oxidative stress can be created by a, a, a lot of conditions. For example, it could be created by drugs. So, drug-induced oxidative stress and some of the important drugs that you should know can cause an episode of hemolysis in, in G6PD patients are you know, primaquine. So primaquine is an important drug that you should know. Then chlorpropamide, okay? Then nitrofurantoin, dapsone, methylene blue, right? Amyl nitrate. So these are some of the important drugs that you should know are considered absolutely unsafe in G6PD patients, right? Then it could be chemical induced oxidative stress. The common ones that you should definitely know are fava beans, right? So favism and naphthalene and uh, you know henna compounds so these are some of the chemicals which are considered unsafe in g6pd patients now let's relate these things now our patient had a urinary tract infection which is again uh, you know um, uh, you know we would do a urine routine microscopy at the first and usually at 12 to 16 weeks so uh, when, it, when she presented to us at 24 weeks we would have done a urine rm and we found out that she has a uti she could even have an asymptomatic bacteriuria, which is definitely treated in pregnancy. You know, uh, if you do not treat asymptomatic bacteriuria in pregnancy, 30 to 40% of these patients will eventually develop symptomatic UTI, right? And up to 25% can develop 
pyelonephritis. So that's why we decided to give her an antibiotic therapy. Now, what are the likely antibiotics we use for urinary tract infection? So usually the common medications that we use are beta-lactams. Okay, then we can also use lexin, considered safe, then uh, nitrofurantoin and uh, as as phosphomycin and uh, trimethoprim and uh, you know uh, uh, sulfamethoxazole combination. So those are the commonly used drugs for the urinary tract infections. So do you hear a common drug that I talked about as oxidative stress in G6PD and for urinary tract? What was the common drug? NFT nitrofurantoin right so nitrofurantoin is a commonly used drug for urinary tract infections in pregnancy right and probably this patient received nft and because of nft there was uh, or nitrofurantoin there was a uh, oxidative stress which resulted in the acute episode of hemolysis and that's why there is a sudden drop in hemoglobin so i repeat the key symptoms right appearance of jaundice dark urine pallor and sudden drop in hemoglobin which is significant three to four gram percent or sudden drop of hemoglobin now what are features of hemolytic anemias right so that is how we reach to the answer of g6pd right and uh, you know uh, the other features of hemolytic anemias would be a low haptoglobin and a raised levels of LDH. Those are also features of hemolysis. And you know, what would you find if you do a peripheral smear? You know, maybe we could have gone one level further in this MCQ. And instead of asking you only the diagnosis, we would say we would also give you the following is, you know, the peripheral smear picture of the patient. And then we will ask you what is the likely diagnosis? So what are these arrows showing you? Yes, they are showing you the bite cells or the blister cells, right? So the classic features of G6PD on peripheral smear are bite cells or blister cells. And if you do special stains, then you can even see the Heinz bodies, right? So those are classic findings for G6PD, right? So that's how it is associated. And the answer to this question is C, G6PD, right? So that's what integrated videos are all about you know the mcq begins with an mcq which looks like obstetric then you realize it has nothing to do with obstetrics it's probably pathology because it's going down to the types of anemias and then you realize that oh this has an element of biochemistry as well we are talking about an enzyme deficiency here and then you have to know the details of that enzyme deficiency and its association with drugs so pharmacology also comes in and um, that's the beauty of integrated questions. You use all your information together to reach to a clinical diagnosis. So we had an element of obstetrics here, of uh, pathology here. We had an element of biochemistry and even pharmacology, right? So I hope you find this uh, EQ series uh, helpful uh, to approach the next pattern clinically integrated videos. If you want us to make videos on certain special topics, do send in a message. Otherwise, we will keep posting more such videos for you on YouTube as well, Adam's Daily Channel, as well as on eMedicos. Thank you so much. Best.